uh, thank you and uh, praise the Lord for such a wonderful uh, blessings that uh, he is giving unto us that uh, we may be able to share his word. And uh, I'd like to share something brief today on uh, arouse the dormant gifts. And so I'd like us to pray and then uh, be able to enter into the session fully. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we need you and uh, we would like to be used as uh, part of the channels of blessing to this world. And Lord, so I pray that uh, you may cleanse us, that we may be vessels of honor in thy sanctuary to be used to offer spiritual sacrifices. And in this hour, as we look at uh, the topic of uh, arousing the dormant gifts, Lord, help us to understand that you are calling us to use the capabilities you have uh, given unto us to further your kingdom than to use them on selfish ambitions. And so glory and honor be unto thy name. May you take uh, the glory of man and put it in dust that the glory of Christ may only be seen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, yes, and uh, so I want to look at something on uh, arousing the the dormant gift, something that is so important for us to understand that the great army of the Lord is being made up and soon, no one knows how soon, the number will be made up and Christ shall come to be able to take his own and then they shall be with him forevermore. Uh, I'm looking at uh, the book of uh, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 and um, verse uh, 7 to verse 14, and then we look at uh, something just uh, briefly. In uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, we are told, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that uh, descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Uh, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stage of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be not more children tossed to and fro and carried away, uh, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And so we find that uh, Christ promised the gift of uh, the Holy Spirit upon his church. And that gift is the baptism of fire. That gift is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that uh, promise did, was not just to come for our character formation and transformation, but uh, when it was given as the fruit of the Spirit, it also comes with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, endowing to each one of us according to the measure that uh, we have received uh, from Christ. And so Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And the, the issue that I'm dealing with is arouse the dormant gifts. No Christian, no child of God who has entered into his service and ever professed his name can say that you see um, just like that, like a Christian, I don't have any capability to work in the kingdom of God. I don't have any gift to work for the Lord. No, that is not what is written in the Bible. The Bible says that, but unto every one of us. 
is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And this gift we understand is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then you see what is accompanying this gift is grace. Now, what is grace? Grace is that enabling power, the power from Christ to humanity, to Christians, to do that which they cannot do for themselves or without Christ. Christ says that without me, you can do nothing. And so as a child of God, and in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, we are told that because you are sons, then um, um, he has given you the spirit of his son uh, crying, Abba, Father. And so every child of God has been, has been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that gift of the Holy Spirit, we are being told that um, it is given with grace, the enabling power, enabling to do what? Enabling not only for character transformation, but look at it very carefully. To some, he gave apostles. And so when Christ promises the comforter, he doesn't just promise the comforter for the transformation of the character. He promises the comforter that comes with the gifts of apostleship, the prophetic office. And when we speak about prophetic office, it's not about just seeing dreams and vision, but uh, being able to teach the word of the Lord uh, in an understanding uh, way, in a, a way that uh, people can understand, that is understanding prophecies and um, uh, being able to interpret them. The gift of, pro of prophecy has been reduced to seeing visions and having dream, but uh, that is a misuse of the word, uh, the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy encompasses understanding prophecies that have been written by the prophets and then interpretation of them with the same uh, spirit that gave the gift of prophecy is the same gift it's the same spirit that gives the gift of interpretation of the prophecies therein. And so we are told that every one of us is given grace, and that grace is the enabling power for being an apostle, being a prophet, being an evangelist, being a pastor, and being a teacher. And what are all these gifts to do? We are told in verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 4, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. And so we are not just to come to the church and pray to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for character formation, which is an essential part in Christianity. But then we cannot be docile, we cannot be idle in the vineyard, claiming that we do not have the grace or the power to work for the ministry, while the Bible says that everyone of us has been given the grace, and then for the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so uh, this grace is the enabling power. How do we know that this grace is the enabling power? When you go to the book of um, uh, Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, uh, Romans chapter 12, and I'm looking from uh, verses uh, 3, Romans chapter 12 from verses 3 down to verses 8. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7, we are told that everyone of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of, the, of, um, of Christ. But in Romans chapter 12, the same author of Ephesians is the same uh, is the author of uh, the book of Romans. And let us see what he means that a measure, um, uh, uh, everyone is given grace according to the measure. What does it mean that uh, everyone is given grace? Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. So uh, Paul has been given grace. And uh, let us see, what is this grace that he has been given? He says, let everyone think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of the faith. And so in Galatians, he calls it the measure of the gift. 
in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 3, he calls it a measure of faith. And what is this measure of faith? In Galatians, he listed the, uh, the, the gifts or uh, the offices in the church which are to help in the edification of the church until it comes to the perfect man. It comes into maturity. And now in Romans chapter 12, he's going to mention this measure of faith. And uh, let us see what it is. Verses four, for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another. Having then what? Gifts. The measure, the grace given, the measure of the gift of Christ and then being prophets, apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Here in Romans chapter 12, he says in verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. And then he repeats the word grace, which is the enabling power for the ministry, for the perfection of the saints. That grace given to us, and let, then he says, whether prophesy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that sheweth mercy with cheerfulness. And so we see that um, this grace, this measure of uh, the gift of Christ, this measure of faith is actually the gifts of the Holy Spirit to the church, and they are given for the ministry. Now, um, just as much as the work of saving souls have not come to an end, so we can be sure that the gifts have not come to an end in the church of God. And uh, we are told that the gifts shall continue to be there until the second coming of Jesus Christ, until the plan of redemption upon this earth is finished and Christ has taken his church uh, into eternality. And so, it is a high time we thought about these things, that um, what are we doing with the grace that we have been given uh, by Jesus Christ? When uh, the churches see young men possessing zeal to qualify them to extend their labors to cities, villages, and towns that have never been aroused to the truth and missionaries volunteering to go to other nations to carry the truth to them, the churches will be encouraged and strengthened far more than by receiving the, labor, the labors of uh, uh, inexperienced men. But uh, as they see their ministers' hearts all aglow with love and zeal for truth and with desire to save souls, the churches will arouse. That everyone will ask himself or herself, what is this capability that the Lord has given unto me to work in his vineyard? These are generally uh, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit given to us to empower us, to strengthen us, to bless and to gather up the sheep and the lambs in the fold. And so we need to look into these young men that are being called to Christ. What is it that the Lord has endowed with them that can make them active servants in the vineyard of the Lord instead of just um, leaving the youths to loiter and uh, fend for themselves and uh, run the things the way they want. Uh, we should see as churches are established, it should be said before them, it is even from among them that men must be taken to carry truth to others. The young men who are still zealous, the young men who don't have responsibilities are to be used to raise up new churches uh, and therefore, they must work and cultivate to the uttermost talents that God has given unto them, rather than let them uh, uh, lie dormant. You know, sometimes we behave like um, the uh, foolish virgins. And you understand from Matthew chapter 25 that um, the foolish virgins were given talents, but they buried it in the ground. That story is amazing. You, you never connect it. But uh, that is how things seem like because the uh, virgins were there and they did not carry the extra oil to help them to be able to do the work at the time which it needed to be done. 
You see, the experience they should have gained before that time, they did not use that time to get that experience. And when the crisis came, then it was seen who had pre uh, prepared himself or herself. And so even today, our young men, we see our young men and uh, we see even the older people, we see the church and uh, it has been left that, uh, oh, it is only the ordained ministers. It is only those who are salaried that are should be able to do the work. But uh, the young men should be encouraged to arouse their talents and not behave like the five foolish virgins who took their talent and buried it in the ground and um, said that they know that the master is a, a hard master. He earns where he had not sown. At the end of the day, they were thrown in darkness. When they came back, the door was closed. This man that had buried the talent, he, it was taken away from him and uh, he missed the kingdom. And so um, the reason why we, we as a church, the reason why there has been so little accomplished that by those who preach the truth is not wholly that the truth they bear is unpopular, but the, uh, uh, the men who bear the message are not sanctified by the truth they preach. And so if we enter into the service of the Lord, if we are not sanctified, the Lord will not put the new wine into old wine skins. And you understand that uh, the wine is uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so you will find men going into the field who are not qualified by the Holy Spirit. And the work of conversion is not the work of men. By the way, the only thing men have to do is to preach the word of God. But then these men have to go with sanctified lips so that uh, the power of God, the Holy Spirit, uh, the divine affluence from God may accompany their words. And uh, as Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says that uh, the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, it uh, pierces into the heart and the sinews of the uh, human being. Uh, when uh, the truth comes from their lips, they, it may go with a holy influence it, and it may be accompanied by converting power. But the reason why we are accomplishing so little, it is because um, unconsecrated ministers make the work very hard for those who follow after them and who have the burden and the spirit of work upon them. You find that people are going to the field with their um, uh, unconsecrated character. And so the power of the Holy Spirit is not attending to their labors and those who follow after them really find it hard. And so young men who are engaged in the work of saving souls should not trust too much their own abilities. The work of working for the sinners cannot be achieved by the human abilities. It is not, um, uh, the race is not for the swift or the quick. The, the race we are told it is not by might or power, but by the Holy Spirit of God. They are in, in experience and should seek to learn wisdom from those who have long experience in the work and who have had opportunities to study the character of Christ and be able to get an experience. And so, um, one thing that has made us also remain in a dormant state, in idle state, we are looking at arousing the dormant gifts in us. It is because we have thought that uh, our labors should be confined within the churches and we don't want to go to the fields which are unentered to do the work of the Lord. And why are we not able to go to this unentered field? It is because that... Um, we haven't gotten that power uh, from on high. Uh, Romans, uh, I mean, uh, Acts chapter one, verses eight says that uh, you shall receive power and you shall be my witnesses. Now, when you look at what is happening in the book of Acts, when the disciples received the gift of the Holy Spirit, they were not only transformed in, uh, uh, in character, but they were imbued with the gift of the Holy Spirit and they went doing marvelous things. And so we have confined ourselves in churches and uh, we have taken up uh, the comfortable position in this gospel work, which should not be so. It is because we are not being stirred up by the Holy Spirit to do something. And so 
as able men are converted to the truth, they should not require laborers to keep their flag in faith um, uh, alive. But these men should be impressed with the necessity of laboring in the vineyard. As long as churches rely upon laborers from abroad to strengthen and encourage their faith, they will not become strong in themselves. They, um, you find that uh, uh, they should, this youth, be instructed that their strength will increase in proportion to their personal efforts. If we are not trying anything, then uh, nothing will come uh, to uh, unto us to be able to do the work. You find that um, in the book of First uh, Corinthians, in the book of First Corinthians, we are looking at arousing the dormant gifts and using them for the vineyard, uh, in the vineyard or um, uh, in the in the work of the Lord. In First uh, Corinthians. Um, is it chapter First Corinthians chapter three? First Corinthians chapter three and uh, verses nine. We are told, for we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Now think about that. The Lord is saying that uh, we are co-laborers with him. We are his husbandry. Now, if we are laborers with uh, God, what should we be expecting from him if we will be effective in our work? Book of John chapter 3, verses 34, arousing the dormant gifts. Romans chap uh, John chapter 3, verses um, 34, it says, for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. That the Lord will desire that the fullness of the Godhead dwell in us. That sanctifying influence that has the grace, the enabling power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit to be able to do the work. And so, Instead of being intolerant and pride, we should be seeking the Lord so that uh, he may pull all the stronghold of the powers of darkness uh, from us. And then uh, uh, we should not neglect personal piety, purity of heart, and entire consecration to God. If we will need to be filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit, then we need to wait upon the Lord. And we are not going to wait in idleness. He says that watch. And that watching is not watching in idleness, but watching by doing something. And so there's a danger of um, a feeling that we are increased with goods and we have no need of anything. And how uh, uh, do we come to a point we feel that we are increased in goods and have no need of anything by um, uh, 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 um, dwelling so much maybe on what we know and uh, confining the message within ourselves and spending so much time in uh, seeking that which is not of saving power. This is a kind of uh, spiritual pride, a people who know so much, but they are not doing so much. That is the problem we are facing right now. A people who claim to know much, but a people who are not doing much. How is it that we are not doing some work in proportion to what we know already? It is because there is lack of vital religion, but only spiritual pride. And where there is spiritual pride, there is no the gift of the Holy Spirit. There is no the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so in order for us to be able to be used of God, then uh, we have to be emptied bottles. We have to be emptied bottles and uh, we should expect to receive from Christ. I'd like us to read something here in Signs of the Time, uh, which is something which is um, really good. We are told in the Signs of the Time, before he left his disciples, Christ breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. 
And he said, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. Now, continued on, we are told, but not until after the ascension was this gift received in its fullness, not until through faith and prayer the disciples had surrendered themselves fully for his working was the outpouring of the spirit bestowed. Then in a special sense, the goods of heaven were committed to the followers of Christ, signs of the time, March 15, 19, 10, paragraph one. When he ascended up on high, he led captive, captive, captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ, the spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. The gifts are already ours in Christ, but their actual possession depends upon our reception of the spirit of God. So there is no way we are going to arouse the dormant gifts if we haven't received the spirit of God. If we do not come into the possession of the spirit of God, we cannot come into possession with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so these talents and the gifts, how should they be used? We are told the talents that Christ entrusts to his church represent especially the gifts and blessings imparted by the Holy Spirit. To one is given by the spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same spirit to another faith, by the same spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another designing of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but all this worketh that one and the self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Not all the gifts are imparted to each believer, but to every servant of the master, some gift of the spirit is promised according to his need for the Lord's work. And by the way, that is why it is important that uh, we become a church and not independent atoms. There's a lot of need of gospel order, organization and discipline so that uh, we may die of this self and become a church and not independent atoms. We are told that the gifts are not given to one person. One has this gift and another this gift and another this gift. And this is the parts of the body of the church or, or of the body of Christ, I mean, the church of God. And the, the body has several parts. One place has eyes, another nose, another we have the mouth, we have the hands, we have the legs. And uh, these parts of the body do not do same things, but yet they are synchronized in that when one part of the body works, the other parts of the body are affected and they move along with. It. And so if one person is a hand and another person the eye and another person the legs, and um, we bring all these capabilities and the grace according to the measure of the gift we have been given together, then we shall find that um, one who is prophesying is prophesying and the church is moving. Another one who is uh, having the gift of government is governing and then things are moving. Another one has um, the gift of healing. And when he does the work, the whole body of Christ is edified. But uh, we are missing this because um, we lack um, the togetherness that uh, should bind all these gifts together so that they may be uh, uh, um, uh, they may be useful to the church. They may be profitable to the church. Uh, you know, there's nothing more beautiful than uh, the plan of giving men uh, and women diversity of gifts. And why is that? Because they will complement each other and be complete in God. Think about if all one man could have everything. You know, there will be an exercise of lordship and kingship or queenship amongst us if one person was endowed with everything. And that is why God uh, uh, does this. He's, he, he divides to each. The church is his garden adorned with a variety of trees, plants, and flowers. He does not expect the high soap to assume the proportion of the cedar or the olive to reach the height of the stately palm. Many have received but a limited religious and intellectual training, but God has a work for this class to do if they will labor in humility, 
trusting in him and not depending on, on themselves to do things. We need Christ. We need Christ's spirit so that uh, these dormant gifts may be aroused in us. Um, we, we, we have another statement in the Science of the Time, March 15, where we are told that uh, God has different ways of working and ha he, he has different workmen to whom he entrusts varied gifts. One worker may be a ready speaker, and uh, I, I like just to share this so that uh, we may catch up with the reference together. We are told that uh, God has different ways of working, and he has different workmen to whom he entrusts varied gifts. One worker may be a ready speaker, another a ready writer, another may have the gift of sincere, earnest, fervent prayer, another the gift of singing, another may have special skill in explaining the word of God with clearness. And each gift is to become a power for good because God works with the laborer. To one God giveth the word of wisdom to another knowledge, but all are to work under the same head. The diversity of gifts leads to a diversity of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. And, uh, you know, when he uh, ascended high, he took captivity captive and divided several to each of us. And so as uh, we try to bring this to an end, we should be asking ourselves, what is it that the Lord has given to me for edifying his church? And have I been running as an independent atom or has I been part of the church of God? Different gifts are imparted to different ones that the workers may feel their need for one another. Do you feel that you need somebody else in your ministry or you feel self-sufficient where, wherever you are? You are the one who can speak prophecy. You, can, you are the one who can give the word of wisdom. You are the one who can heal. You are the one who can baptize. You, you are everything. Is this the way that you, you find yourself feeling? Or you find yourself incapable and needing of some help from another brethren? This is how we should be feeling and we should feel a need of each other more so when we see uh, the end coming. Uh, in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, look at Hebrews chapter 10. And um, this, uh, the Bible discouraging being independent atoms, but uh, uh, moving together as a unit. Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, look at verses uh, 23 to 25. We are told, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for it is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, not being these independent atoms, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. As we see the day of the Lord approaching, let us ask ourselves, are we provoking each other unto love? and? Uh, nurturing the talents and the gifts that the Lord has given unto us for the perfecting of the saints, for the ministry to the church. And so it may seem to some that the contrast between their gift and the gifts of a fellow laborer is too great to allow them to unite in harmonious effort. Think about this for a moment. Uh, and uh, we are looking at um, arousing the dormant gifts and how selfishness has been part of our being until Christ cannot work in us to finish the work. This is Science of the Time, March 15, 19, 10, paragraph 7. Um, this is what we read. It may seem to some that uh, the contrast between their gifts and the gifts of a fellow laborer is too great to allow them to unite in harmonious effort. But when they remember that there are varied minds to be reached and that some will reject the truth as it is presented by one laborer only to open their hearts to the same truth as presented in a different manner by another, they will hopefully endeavor to labor together in unity. Their talents, however diverse, may all be under the control of the same spirit. 
in every word and act, kindness and love will be revealed. And as each worker fills his appointed place faithfully, the prayer of Christ for the unity of his followers will be answered and the world will know that these are his disciples. And so with these different capabilities, with this different grace, with these different gifts, we are told one can speak something which is truth and it be rejected by someone. And the same truth is presented by another from a different angle. And the same person who rejected the other one accepts this truth. And that is in the working of the law. And that is why we need each other. That is why we need the presence of Jesus Christ so that uh, we may be able to accomplish what he has promised. And so lastly, the outpouring of the spirit in the days of apostles were the former reign and we are waiting for what we call the latter reign. That is essentially the working of the efficacious uh, a power of God at a greater extent, not confined only to a certain nation, to a certain people, but all over the world permeating Christendom and being able to turn uh, the hearts of men unto God, to turn to uh, uh, the stronghold of uh, the enemy and be able to destroy it. We are talking as Satan increases his hellish darkness upon the world the Lord is uh, about to do something great for his child. In the book of Isaiah chapter 60, Isaiah chapter 60, this is what the Lord is intending to accomplish through the consecrated vessels. In Isaiah chapter 60, it says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And so in proportion to the darkness that shall be in the world, I want to bring this point so that we may understand. In proportion to the darkness that shall be in the world, the Lord shall endow his servants with the light that can be able to outshine the darkness in the world. Now think about this for a moment. It is only light that will do away with darkness. And what is this light? We are told it is the spirit of the Lord, the glory, the Shekinah glory of God. Look at this. This light has to bring life in us. It has to arouse this dormant, this dying gifts in us. In the book of John chapter one, Look at this keenly. In proportion to the darkness in the world, so shall the light shine. And what is this light? The Shekinah glory, the power of the Holy Ghost, which is called the latter rain. In John chapter 1, verses 4, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And so, the Holy Spirit is the light, and the Holy Spirit is life. The things which are dormant can only be revived by the light and the life of God. In Ezekiel chapter 37, it is said it is the breath that is given to these dry bones, and then they become a great army. There is no army that can go to a war without instruments of war. And so the children of God have to, be at, have to be dressed with the full armor of God, which are the fruits of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit, because the war that we are in is a spiritual war, and it does not need carnal weapons. It needs spiritual weapons. And so unless we arouse these dormant gifts by receiving the life and the light, the light in him was the life of men. And this we are seeing is the breath of life. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the latter rain coming to his people so that they may be able to accomplish that which they could not do um, uh, uh, for themselves. And um, the center 
and the main focus of righteousness by faith is um, laying the glory of man in dust so that Christ may do for him what he cannot do for himself. Now, what is this that Christ can do for us which we cannot do for ourselves? We cannot buy the Holy Spirit. We cannot buy the oil. You look at the foolish virgins, they went to buy oil. Now, the Holy Spirit cannot be bought. Righteousness of Christ cannot be bought. And so what we need in this hour is Christ himself to breathe upon us as dead born so that we may live. So uh, in Science of the Time, again, March 15, 19, 10, paragraph 9, uh, this is um, what uh, we, we find. Um, Christ declares that the divine influence of the spirit was to be with his followers unto the end. But by some, this promise is not appreciated as it should be. It is fulfillment is not realized as it might be. Learning, talents, eloquence, every natural or acquired endowment may be possessed, but without the presence of the spirit of God, no heart will be touched, no sinner won to Christ. When his disciples are connected with Christ, when the gifts of the spirit are theirs, even the poorest and most ignorant of them will have a power that will tell upon hearts. Praise the Lord. God makes them the channel for the outworking of the highest influence in the universe. As the divine endowment, the power of the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples, so it will today be given to all who seek a right. This power alone is able to make us wise unto salvation and to fit us for the course above. Christ wants us to give us a blessing that will make us holy. These things have I spoken unto you. He says that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Joy in the Holy Spirit is health giving, life giving. In giving us his spirit, God gives us himself, a fountain of divine influences to give health and life to the world. We have seen that in him was light and the light was the life of men. And so, uh, looking at this as we end, the promise of the gifts is just as strong and trustworthy now as in the days of the apostles. This sign shall follow them that, that believe. The gifts of him who has all power in heaven and in earth are in store for his children, gifts so precious that they come to us through the costly sacrifice of the Redeemer's blood, gifts that will satisfy the deepest craving of the heart, gifts lasting us eternity. Will you not come to God as little children, appropriate his promises, plead them before him as his own ones? If you do, you will receive fullness of joy and uh, this is exactly what we want to do. We want to approach the Lord like little children. I'll read the last verse in the book of Hebrews. We need just to come to Christ the way we are, and um, he will be able to give us his efficacious power, the Holy Spirit, which will come with the power to be able to overcome sin, and also it will come with the gifts to empower us to be able to do ministerial work in his vineyard. The last verse is Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and verses 16. For we have not an a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. That is character transformation by the Spirit we have character transformation. Then we have the second part, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. We find that is the enabling power, not only for character transformation, but the endowment of the gift of the Holy Spirit to be able to do the work of Christ. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And uh, would you agree with me that uh, we are in the time of need right now? You are seeing everything that it was prophesied happening. There is the financial collapse, and it's going to happen so speedily. No one will know what has hit them. 
by the way, there are wars escalating. There are riots all over the world. There is the increase of gas all over the gasoline everywhere. There is the increase of basic needs. And what we need is the power of the Holy Spirit to give us the boldness to face the period that is before us. Without the Holy Spirit of God, Christ says that we cannot do anything. We can do nothing. And so I want just to plead with me. I want to plead with you also. I want to plead with us. Let us afresh give our hearts to the Lord. And let us expect him to fulfill his word in us, even the promise of the Holy Spirit, so that we may be endowed with power, not only to preach in Jerusalem, but to the uttermost parts of the world. And so may the Lord bless us, and may we consider if these things be so. And if they be so, let us embrace them and seek the Lord while he may be found. Shall we close with a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, thank you once again because you want to minister unto us. And so we want to come empty that we may be filled once again. It is so difficult to deal with cups which are full because there's nothing that can be poured on them or in them. But now, Lord, may you help us to be emptied so that you may fill again. And the only way to empty ourselves is to get into service. So that whatever little thing that we know, we may use it so that we may get more. For the light in us, if it is not used, it turns into darkness. We cannot work in thy vineyard without thy spirit. And so we pray that uh, you may fill us with your own self, that we may be able to work in thy vineyard. Glory and honor be unto thy name. Bless your children. This is my request in Jesus' name. Amen.